Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And joining me today as a first-time guest is K.A. Nelson, whose book on the U-boat war off the New Jersey coast is linked in the description below. And we are here to talk about the claim that U-boat crews routinely uh, killed survivors in the water by focusing on a particular story off the coast. So I'll bring him in now. Good afternoon, sir. How are you today? Good afternoon, or I guess good evening over in your end, Paul. Absolutely great. Great to be here. Brilliant. Well, we're going to hand it over to you. I'll bring up your PowerPoint, folks. Um, just feel free to put any comments in the in the sidebar there. We may have time to get them. We may not. But I'm going to hand over to my guest to kind of take us through this uh, this this claim stroke story. All right. Well, thanks again, Paul. It's really an honor to be here. And I uh, apologize for the technical mix up that we had earlier for, for everyone else that's watching. I'm on my phone right now. So, um, Paul, as we had discussed uh, over the weekend, I originally had uh, taken your your offer to uh, you, when you had posted on Twitter looking for people to address a few of these World War II myths. I thought this one would be a good one that I could field. And in the course of thinking about how best to approach it, I remembered that I have a quite an interesting story that uh, a mystery of sorts that I stumbled across during the course of my research for my upcoming book, Killing Shore, and it, it dovetails well with this topic, uh, as well as with the topic of neutral merchant shipping during uh, World War II. So I'm going to present both of these as a preface to the Rio Tercero mystery. So with that, just to orient everybody geographically and orient everyone in time and space here, this is a custom drawing that I commissioned from a very talented uh, artist down in Delaware named Bob Pratt. He does a lot of these types of maps for various history books. And this picture shows all of the ships, both Allied and German, that were lost to combat action in the area that was pictured in World War II. If I included World War I, there'd be twice as many icons on the thing. But that uh, in the middle there, you see a uh, red starburst. That is where the Rio Tercero went down. You can go to next. So the, as many of your viewers, many people listening already know, the Battle of the Atlantic really entailed Germany's attempt to cut off the Western Hemisphere from the rest of the world by destroying the merchant ships that the Allies were using to carry supplies, food, gasoline, everything that a war machine needs. Were, these were being transported across the Atlantic by civilian crewed merchant ships, civilian crewed cargo ships that are known as merchant vessels. So in addition to the thousands of allied merchant vessels that were in harm's way on the high seas, there were also quite a few ships for neutral countries. These are countries like Ireland, Chile, Sweden, those that had chosen neither the Axis nor the Allies. And these ships were, all of them were strictly off limits for attack. According to uh, Standing War Order 101 from the German Naval High Command was in effect throughout the war. So they couldn't be deliberately attacked. However, all the same, there were hundreds of neutral ships that were tragically sent to the bottom due to mistaken identity. And this is even less surprising when you consider that most of these attacks were at night, oftentimes in limited visibility conditions that prevented the U-boat commander from being able to recognize the neutrality markings that neutral ships usually carry. This would be the, something to the effect of the name of the ship, the name of the home port, large images of the flag painted on the hull, all with the purpose of preventing an attack, hoping that a, and this didn't apply just to U-boats, that any, any combatant in any warship or aircraft would hopefully not attack them if it was immediately recognizable that they were neutral. All the same, there were quite a few neutrals sunk. Anyway, um, it, you could see a statistic there in the first year of the war, uh, British Foreign Office reported 253 neutral ships sunk. And then there were, in 1942, there were nine of them sunk along the U.S. East Coast. So you were in harm's way, even if you were a, a sailor for a neutral country due to uh, collateral damage situations. Next. So the most pervasive fear among the merchant mariners in the Second World War was the notion of getting 
shot in the water after having escaped a sinking ship. And I, I came across this over and over in the primary sources, in the newspaper accounts where survivors gave their eyewitness testimony. These guys were widely and understandably terrified that even if they survived their ship going down, that they would then be murdered in the water. Fortunately for them, for the mariners, there's only one confirmed instance of this occurring in World War II. That was the U-852, which murdered survivors of the Peleus of South Africa. It was a Greek ship. There's another alleged incident involving the U-247, but the details there are not as firm, and there was no one left alive to, to prosecute. But the, the commander of the U-852, he became the only U-boat commander ever prosecuted on war crimes charges. He was found guilty and hanged a few months after the war ended. So even though this was not a likely fate for any given mariner, it was something that they were very aware of, mm. they were terrified of, and, and it did happen. So it, it wasn't, a, wasn't an imaginary peril by any means. Next. All right. So the Rio Tercero is the subject of Chapter 13 of Killing Shore. The Rio Tercero was an Argentine freighter, so a neutral ship under the command of Captain Pedro Scalise, or Scalisi, I guess would be the proper pronunciation. The Rio Tercero was making her return journey from New York City to Argentina. She was, because she was a neutral, she was not traveling in convoy, she was not zigzagging, and she was not armed. She was southbound about 90 miles off of Atlantic City on 24 June, 1942, when she was hit by a single torpedo amidships. It gouged a huge hole in the hull, flooded the engine room almost immediately. It was a, a mortal wound. This torpedo had been fired by the U-202, which was a Type 7C U-boat under the command of Captain Lieutenant Hans Heinz Linder. So the ship was badly maimed. The captain gave the order, Captain Scalisi gave the order to abandon ship. The radio operator did succeed in sending a very short mayday before abandoning ship, but the, the Rio Tercero went down within 10 minutes. So this left 37 Argentines afloat in two lifeboats, which they lashed together so that they would stay apart, stay together. And moments after the Rio Tercero has disappeared under the surface, the U-202 appeared. It surfaced and began to approach the survivors. Now, I need to pause here and say that that type of encounter of a U-boat encountering survivors of the ship that had just sunk was very, very common along the U.S. coast during 1942. It wasn't so common out in the open Atlantic because ships were traveling in convoy but for individual ships along the U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast, yes, it was very common to, for the survivors to see the U-boat uh, within moments of entering the water. Uh, this was, as you might think, this was kind of the moment of utmost fear for those mariners um, that were in the water. Um, so this was something that when I read these primary sources and, and see this sense of terror that comes through, it's oftentimes in the context of, and then we saw the U-boat. Oftentimes they could hear it before they saw it. But in almost all instances, the U-boat either stopped to question the survivors briefly, or more often than not, the U-boat just continued on its way. So these sorts of harrowing encounters were very common, although in most instances, they weren't terribly notable, or noteworthy. So the 37 men are now in the water in two lifeboats, and now the U-boat's approaching them. When the U-boat got to the survivors, uh, Linder, the U-202's commander, he actually brought Captain Scalisi aboard the U-boat to question him. This is very, very unusual. Um, it happens little more often in World War I, but it was rare in World War II for anyone to be brought aboard a U-boat while it was on patrol. It did happen sometimes. Occasionally, a crew would bring back a survivor as a POW, particularly if it was a naval ship. But for a, for any for any other situation, it was uncommon for these U-boats to bring people aboard, uh, especially uncommon if it was just a merchant captain. 
So that is a something incongruous in the story that um, I've never been able to fully explain it on, and it only makes the other two parts of the mystery a little bit weirder. So Linder brings Captain Scalise aboard the U-boat, questions him briefly. The questions really pertain to the identity of the ship. What was the name of your ship? What, what country is it registered to? Uh, unfortunately for them, there was no common language between them. Linder spoke German, English, and French, and Scalise only spoke Spanish. So they, they weren't really able to communicate well. This only went on for a few minutes, and then Linder released Scalise and put him, sent him back to, to the lifeboat with the other survivors. Now, I should call out at this point that of those two pictures on the right, the bottom one, it, that is the U-202, and that is pretty much exactly the view that the survivors would have had because they were mm -hmm. in the lifeboats down at water level with the U-boat beside them, and, and Linder would have appeared up there in the tower. So at this point, Linder has returned to the lifeboats, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the first part of this mystery, which if you could go to the next slide, Paul. All right, so Linder was adamant in his logbook and in the radio messages he sent back to headquarters that the ship had no markings on it at all. That was his excuse for why he torpedoed it. Uh, there, was, there was nothing on it indicating that it belonged to a neutral country. As you can see in the photo below, that is a bit of a stretch. <laughs> It, it's hard to see because it's a black and white image, but th those are five Argentine flags painted on the port side of the ship. It also says Buenos Aires and Rio Tercero three times. And this was, of course, mirrored on the other side of the ship. Additionally, this was not at night in poor weather. This was in the morning in June on a day with sun and calm weather. And this picture, this exact picture, was taken six days before the attack. So Linder's claim of I not I, nothing I saw on the ship communicated that it was neutral. There were no markings, as you can see, patently false. Uh, if you could go go forward again to the next one, that no no the picture, sorry that yeah. So that picture, as I said, was taken six days in advance of the sinking. Also, Linder noted specifically in his log that he approached closely enough that he could see which lifeboats were being loaded and which ones weren't. Well, I, I call your attention to the lifeboat in the picture. It's under the smokestack on the port side of the ship. If you're close enough to see whether there's people in that lifeboat or not, you are absolutely close enough to see the massive Argentine flags below it. He claimed that he saw nothing at all. So at this point, Scalisi is um, led out of the U-boat, he gets back into the lifeboat with his fellow crew. And this is the point where our story takes a much darker turn. Because at, at this point, Linder disappeared from atop the conning tower. He went away. He was not seen again. Linder was replaced with four enlisted sailors who climbed through the hatch. The survivors saw that these four sailors seemed to be carrying objects. It wasn't clear what they were carrying. It would become clear in just a moment. Next slide, please. Two of the sailors were carrying machine guns. Two more were carrying ammunition. The survivors, the merchant crew in these lifeboats, as you can imagine, begin to have a panic meltdown at this instant. They are viewing what they think are the last few seconds of their lives. Mm -hmm. So these two, the four sailors mounted these guns put the belts and ammunition in the feed tray, close the feed, close the guns, rack the charging handle. All the while, these barrels are pointed directly at the survivors and the survivors are watching all of this unfold. You can only imagine what was going through their head at that moment. They were too terrified, most of them, to notice a sound in the distance growing gradually louder. So if you go to the next slide, like something right out of a Hollywood script. At that moment, only after the, the Germans had got the guns loaded and pointed, a B-25 bomber piloted by Second Lieutenant Hugh Maxwell, drop, Maxwell dropped out of the haze and the U-boat immediately began preparing to crash dive. This is attested by the German account of the incident 
the Argentine account of the incident and the pilot's account. So this dramatic nick of time arrival by this bomber, whether or not the survivors were actually going to be shot or not, this just dramatic nick of time arrival is accounted from three different perspectives, all three perspectives of this incident. So you have to spatially, the bomber appeared behind the lifeboat. So the lifeboats were between the bomber and the U-boat. Once it got closer and this sound became unmistakable, the survivors turned around, saw this plane, and they started, as you'd imagine, they went wild with cheering and shouting like a, like a soccer match. The, uh, the, even the German account of the, in fact, the last sentence of the account in the logbook notes the survivors all cheering and waving at this plane coming in to save them. So Lieutenant Maxwell dropped four Mark 17 depth charges inflicted very light damage against the U-202, which was already submerged by that point. The U-202 did succeed in escaping, but the uh, no survivors were harmed. Maxwell circled the survivors till he ran low on fuel. He dropped them a handwritten note as well, and then he radioed their location and headed back for shore. All of the survivors were rescued a few hours after this happened. Next. So addressing the two parts of our mystery here. So the first part, did Linder deliberately attack a neutral ship? I, I don't see how he didn't. Hmm. I, I think he probably saw those markings before he gave the order to launch the torpedo. At a bare minimum, he would have seen them in the 10 minutes before the ship went down over the stern. I can't speak to his reasons for attacking a neutral, but I... I do not see how his story, it just doesn't, it's not plausible. It doesn't add up. So I think he almost certainly did deliberately attack a neutral ship, which is in itself a war crime. Mm. But that brings us to the second part of the mystery, which is did Linder intend to murder these merchant mariners? And, and I don't know. And there's a few pieces of evidence. So let's, let's look at the, the evidence against it, which is that statistically speaking, that would have been quite unlikely. We know that that wasn't a common occurrence, although it did happen. So knowing nothing else, I might have otherwise discarded it on that basis alone. But it is also true that the um, the machine guns, the two machine guns that the survivors said were mounted those two machine guns were not the same as the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun on the Winter Garden. These were the MG-34s that were kept below decks. They were not routinely mounted up on the bridge. It just, they, they, weren't, they weren't really needed and they took too much time to take off. They had to crash dive. So these were not machine guns, these were not uh, weapons that would normally be in place. So if the survivor's account, assuming that what they saw, they, they correctly recalled, which oftentimes with firsthand accounts is not the case, it does raise the question of why would they have mounted those machine guns? Um, I don't have an answer for that. It's possible that the the, for the survivor's testimony of that is is inaccurate. Um, it's it, I will say that it is oddly specific they would mention two machine guns being taken out and mounted because mm. that that was, they did have those below decks and those could be mounted up on the bridge bulwark. So, and then there's um, there's also the fact, of course, that Linder had already committed one war crime. It's not out of the question that he was going to try to erase the witnesses, remove the witnesses by committing yeah. a second one. It's impossible to know. I haven't found anything in in the information that I have about him as an individual, which isn't a whole lot. He wasn't a particularly well-known commandant, but I haven't been able to necessarily find any red flags, but that that doesn't mean a whole lot. So did he intentionally attack a neutral? Almost certainly. Did he intend to massacre the crew? Like so many other histories of the Second World War, I don't think the truth will ever be known, but uh, it is certainly something to reflect on. And that is my show. Brilliant. Well, Thanks, my, my first, I'll, I'll open, uh, there's a couple of questions from viewers we'll tackle. My first question is, how far into his mission from, from whichever port he took off was he on that day? Not that far. So he still, well, I'd say he's about halfway through his patrol and his, his 
patrol in the operational area along the U.S. East Coast would have been about two weeks. So right. you think arrival, about two weeks of patrolling, and then return. This was arrival. They arrived on the 12th. I guess this would have been toward the end now that I think about it. So okay. a- as an aside, Paul, you might be familiar with the story of the four Nazi saboteurs that were landed on the beach on Long mm. Island in 1942. Well, that was this U-boat that happened a few days before this incident. It's coincidental. But so they they dropped them off on the 12th as soon as they arrived. And then they turned to their regular patrolling. So this would have been toward the end, I guess, okay. is the, the short because answer. I'm, I'm just, Mike, I'm just throwing a theory out there. Let's say he, you know, he's been telling his crew, we're going to sink lots of ships. We're going to do this. We're going to take this glory back there. And at the first t- chance they identify this ship, they think it's a legitimate target. Then they kind of raise periscope, blah, blah, and he kind of sees, oh, hang on, shit, it's a, it's a neutral. But by then he's kind of hyped up the crew. He's told them that they're going to do this. Maybe it's kind of a doubling down at that point. You know, he's like, you know, yeah. rather than saying, actually, no, stand down, everybody. Yeah, okay. You know, torpedoes back in the cupboards. Uh, you know, I know that's not how it works, folks. But, you know, I, going, yeah. I wonder whether that's it. That doesn't defend him or anything. And, it, you know, it's just, and then again, the the fact that he mounted the machine guns, you know, he, as you say, he realizes he's, 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 done, he's done a bad thing and he's going to think about, removing the evidence but as you say we we can we've taken this particular story as far as we can go we've got a couple of questions then i want to ask about how why this myth uh, pervades so much but the questions are um what happened to u202 after this the u202 sunk one more ship during its patrol it sunk the city of birmingham it was actually pretty bold the city of birmingham was a passenger ship being escorted by a single uh, destroyer minesweeper. So he attacked a ship that was under, had its own escort, sunk, sank the ship and escaped with just minimal damage from the USS Stansbury. So um, he sunk one more and then he made his return. I'm pretty sure it's only sunk one more, but then he made his return to, so uneventful patrol otherwise. Okay, and another question. To another um, uh... Well, JD from his journal is saying, I also wonder if he felt like he'd been spotted and was concerned that his presence would be reported. That's another possibility. I think that's also plausible as well. I think I think your theory, Paul, from a moment ago, I think that's probably the best answer, you know, given the available evidence. But uh, that that one is also a possibility. And then lastly, why does this idea that U-boats are going to be murdering people in the water pervade? Why is it? I mean, someone mentioned the the Hitchcock film Lifeboat earlier, because in that movie, they're definitely worried about the U-boat surfacing. I know it's a movie trope. Is it, is it movies yeah. or is there something more, more, more depth than that? Well, there was something more to it. So these, these things don't come out of thin air. So I'm glad you mentioned Lifeboat. Uh, great film and actually an excellent example of what I was talking about earlier. But the answer is, I think, really twofold. The first being that the uh, there were more instances, uh, as I understand it, of uh, survivors being murdered by U-boat crews in the first war. Um, I, I'm not nearly, that's not necessarily my, my main house, but um, it did happen more often then. Uh, another reason, so I really got three for you. So it happened in World War One. Another reason is submarines of all navies did it in World War II. Nobody was was clean from it. Um, in fact, the the the, the U boat force would have been among the cleaner submarine in this in this specific regard. And then, of course, there's I think the biggest reason, which is the uh, the Wehrmacht as a whole, the the armed forces of Nazi Germany. It is true that this was an organization that was systemically tainted by national socialist ideology um, that did systemically com- com- systemically commit war crimes. Yeah. Uh, the fact that the U-boat force was probably the cleanest in relative terms in relative out of the Wehrmacht is... The yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> but that's secondary to the fact that the Wehrmacht did commit a, a, quite a few war crimes yeah. and their reputation is well-deserved. I think that's probably the driving the driving thing behind this perception, which, as we saw, wasn't entirely a false perception because it did happen. It's, it's like a lot of the things we're attacking in these shows. It's the idea that Sherman tanks are going to blow up at the drop of a hat. It's that, you know, that these, yeah, yeah. They, they are very pervasive uh, fears because they exist at the time. You know, merchant Navy crewmen were terrified of being sunk by torpedoes. They were terrified. You know, yeah. th- these things 
uh, at the time, uh, yeah, that I always refer it from, from where I'm, I'm in England is the idea of the Germans sending in paratroopers dressed as nuns who are going to be murdering English. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear that one. It I never happened, that one. but it was a genuine yeah. fear. People, people were reporting things to the police stations in 1940 that you know. They I'm not seen. surprised at all. So yeah. you know, and look at the fear across the West Coast in the USA of the Japanese going to be invading. You know, the, mm -hmm. at the time, yeah. these beliefs are very, very strongly held. But anyway. We will leave it there. I'm going to invite you back uh, to talk at, lo at length about your Thank book you. at some point when it comes out. We'll, we'll pick something else. But right now, we're 25 minutes in. We've got another show starting in five minutes. So I'm going to say thank you very much for your appearance. It's been a great one. Folks, thank see you, me Paul. in five minutes. We're talking about the French Army in 1940. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Cheers.